to call the uh, meeting to order for the Kitsap Public Facilities District here on May 24th at 531. Um, and uh, the question of the night is going to be, what was your first job and uh, what did you get paid? All right. What was your first job that you ever had? And what did you get paid? Anybody want to start us off? I will. All right. Uh, I was a dishwasher. I made minimum wage, which was $2.01 per hour. Was that in Maine? It was. <laughs> yeah. All right. Washing lobster dishes. <laughs> all right. So. I was, a, uh, I was a delivery boy for a corner drugstore uh, back in Louisville, Kentucky, and I actually started when I was 15. They had a, de a delivery uh, vehicle, but I didn't have my driver's license, so I delivered on a bicycle for a few months until I turned 16 and got my license, and then I, uh, I, I, I delivered, and... Uh, the drugstore also sold uh, liquor, and about two thirds of my deliveries were liquor deliveries. <laughs> did you ever? Did you ever break a bottle as you were taking it on your bicycle? No, no, no I never broke one. I delivered, uh, like I say, mostly liquor, and the rest were prescription deliveries. I hardly ever delivered anything other than whis whiskey and drugs. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, what what was your pay rate, Walt? As I recall, it was about a dollar and a quarter an hour. Well, I'll I'll take on because that was my starting rate too. Uh, but it was I think I was about five or six, and that was for walking beans. So I think all of you know that I grew up on a farm, and we would have corn and soybeans mostly, but. In the summer, um, uh, end of June, beginning of July, you walk the beans. And what that means is you walk down a mile of uh, farmland. And I would only take one row when I was young, but you build up and you take four rows. And you look for all the weeds that are in the bean field and you go and pick them uh, with your hands, pull them out, and then keep on a truck and keep walking. Um, so that was, that was my first one. And, a dollar twenty-five is what I remember. I got paid. I'll chime in next. I, I don't know if I can follow the rum runner, rum runner Walt, but um, <laughs> not counting all the ones that they paid me to babysit or muck stalls and stuff like that. My first paying job was you had to get a work permit. Do you guys remember this? Where I could swear I was fourteen and a half. We were able to get a work permit. And I sold fabric at a fabric store and you could make a deal with them. They'd sell it to you at a really, really big discount. If once you made the clothes, you could put them on display. So back then we sewed all our own clothes a lot. So most of my clothes sat on display for six months before I could ever wear them, but I got them for almost free. So, and I have no memory of what I got paid per hour. I'm impressed you guys can remember that. That's a great story, Aaron. So I'll go next. I grew up in San Diego and I worked at a restaurant as a busboy from when I was 16 till 18. And I don't remember when I got paid. It was around two something an hour though. Pat, where did you say it was? San Diego. That's where I grew up. All right. What a place to grow up. Do you surf? No, but we went to the beach a lot. I mean, we lived right by the water. It was, it was a great place to grow up. I grew up just south of San Diego in a place called Chula Vista. My wife and I both grew up there. Beautiful. Yeah. All right. Who else? So I, my, my first job was, uh, I don't know if it was a job, had a paper, you know, that's what the boys did growing up. I was 13 or 14 on your bike delivering newspapers over in Shoreline. So it was Seattle Times with the big one on Sundays. That was, that was fun. Um, I don't remember at all what I, you know, got, you know, I always collected the money from the people and they would, you know, might throw in a tip here or there. But then after that, when I finally turned 16 and was able to work legally for a real job, I worked yeah, at, in, in the back kitchen in Den or in Wendy's 
you know, washing dishes and doing all the grunt work. So yeah, good times. Good times. John, I think you're the only one left. Well, I guess I, I let everybody else go. And uh, my first job was working in the office at the church and school that I went to back in Omaha. So they hired, uh, it was like eighth grade too. I was probably 13, but they would hire you so that you would reach to the phones and the door in the afternoon. So I don't know if they had a retiree or somebody who worked during the day, but I, I think I made like $7 an hour for my first job. Um, and you work from like th three to eight or something like that and, uh, two to three days a week. And, uh, yeah, uh, that was my first job and, uh, was mostly watching TV, watching the Simpsons or doing homework in between answering the phone. It has been established that John is the smartest one of us. He got paid the most and he watched TV for his job. Uh, Mike, uh, Brian, how about for you? Yeah, I'll go. Um. My first job, I was a, a locker room attendant at a country club just outside of Chicago. Uh, my track coach was the pool manager at the country club, so he got me the job. So I was uh, picking up dirty towels and mopping up the locker room, and that was as a sophomore. So I was, uh, again, at, yeah, about... Um, 15, 16, something like that. And then as a junior, I was promoted to uh, lifeguard. So I got to sit outside instead of inside when I was doing my job. And then the third year I did that, um, I was a um, pool, no, uh, I was uh, life uh, swimming and diving instructor. So I taught the kids how to swim and I was a very good diver. I used to do one and a half somersaults, pike off the high board and all that. I also used to do the, the goofy stunts during the 4th of July or other events around the, the pool in the holidays. You know, I, jump up to make a dive and miss the board with one foot and tumble into the water. So, you know, I, I enjoy doing that kind of stuff. Thanks for sharing, Mike. How about I you, I have Ryan? no idea. I don't remember what I got paid. You know, it was, it was a few bucks an hour. It certainly wasn't uh, anything remarkable. Um, my first job is, is absolutely the worst job I ever had. Um, <laughs> I was a file clerk for an aluminum company. My dad was the was a metallurgical engineer, and he was he was running the aluminum plant. Um, and I think he just wanted me to not get in any trouble during the summer, so I got hired to work in the office. And every time, like there was a sale or an order of something for an aluminum product, there was a sales sheet that got filled out. And it was back in the day when, when they were not even triplicate, but they were quadruplicate or something. You know, the top sheet was white. The next one was pink. The next one was green. The next one was goldenrod or something like that. And my job was to, after, after an order was signed, was, was to pull all these different color copies apart and, and put them into color-coded binders. And I was the only one in the office who did this. And all the other people, all the salespeople and everybody else were just so happy to have me there because they hated doing that. And every day I'd come into work and there were just, there'd just be stacks of these, these things. So anyway, incredibly boring. I don't know what I got paid, um, but I'm, I'm sure since my dad was running the company at the time, he made sure it was as small as possible. <laughs> That's a good father. That's a good yeah. father. <laughs> Hey, real fast, Mike, did you see the question in Q&A? Hank was asking about being able to see gallery view. Uh, hang on. No, I didn't. I was so engrossed in all the things that you guys were saying. So let me uh, check that out. Q&A, Hank. Please allow gallery view. Does that work for you, Hank?
All right. Uh, we're going to move on uh, to the second item on our agenda here, which is our approval of minutes. Can I have a motion for that? So moved. Thank you, John. Second? I'll second. Any discussion? All right. Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes for the April 26th meeting, say aye. All right. All right. All those opposed, nay. Minutes have been approved. Who was uh, the, who was the I, second? That's me, Phil. All right. Thank you. Moving on to item number three. Uh, do we have anybody uh, who would like to make a public comment? Uh, that's in. Uh, attendance tonight. If you do, uh, please just uh, raise your hand or uh, put something in the question and answer of the chat and we will add you in. Uh, we would ask that you would keep it to three minutes, but if there's anyone who would like to make public comment, this is the time where we give space for this. Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll move on to uh, our, our focus here this evening, which is to hear the regional project update for the uh, South Kitsap uh, event, Conference and Event Center. Uh, so Mike, would you uh, bring in Mayor Patansu and Nick Bond, and we will turn it over to you for that presentation, uh, Mayor Patansu. Hi, this is Lori. Are you going to let us in? I mean, the video. There's actually four of us from my team. There's Steve Rice, Mike Wright, and Angie Thomaser. And Angie, too? Is Angie a member of your team? Yes. Yes. Okay. And Mike Wright. Mike Wright, yeah. Uh oh, we may be outnumbered. All right. Do we have everybody in? Yep, I think we have everybody now. Uh, welcome, Mayor and Steve and team. We'll Thank turn you. it over to you. Yep. Yeah. Turn it over to you, Mayor Pitancer. Thank you. No. Uh, I'm excited to be here tonight. I, I, I hope you're as impressed with uh, the what we're about to share with you as I am. And uh, I'm going to turn this over to Steve in a moment. And then I've got some closing comments uh, because uh, related to the purchase of, of the uh, the property for the site. So that uh, I'll share with you after the presentation. So Steve and Lori, take it away. Okay, you guys don't mind, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, host disabled screen sharing. Can I get permission, please? Do you, uh, let's see. Um, you're going to be doing the manipulating of the, yep. okay. That will be me. So we'll make you a co-host and then you can share. And I'll, uh, I'll move Stephen up to that level too. And if right, he's you guys see my screen? Can I? Yes. Okay. All right. So, uh, first, thanks for having us this evening. As I said, there's four of us from the Rice Fergus Miller team. Um, you guys have met me before. I'm Lori Cook, I'm the project manager. We have Steve Rice, our principal. Uh, the other two folks joining us is Mike Wright, who's the project architect and designer. And we have Angie Thomas, our interior designer. And so each of us have a, well, really the three of them have a piece to present as far as the progress of our design. It's been a, a while since we were in front of you guys with design. I think the last meeting we attended was January. And at the time uh, we shared with you 
there's a site that was selected as well as sort of a bubble diagram of what the program is going to look like for the building. And so we've done a lot of work since then, and that's what we're going to share tonight. Uh, just a reminder that we are in the schematic design phase still, and we are in the middle of that. We're sort of a, this is a progress uh, presentation to you of where we are on that design. Um, so just a reminder of where that site was. Um, as you recall, we selected the Kitsap Bank um, site, which is what you see here as our footprint. Um, this is sort of a overlay of the last GGLO master plan, site plan, and that's where you see the Kitsap Bank building, the proposed mixed use across the street on Bay Street, as well as that uh, proposed marina lift station. And so we're going to focus in on this site here, and I'm going to turn it over to Steve to talk about the site design. Thank you, Lori. Hey, good evening, everybody. Thanks for having us back. Um, Lori's correct. We have done a lot of work. There's still a ways to go in schematics, but wanted to share with you this little diagram you probably will recognize. Um, you've seen many times before the uh, hoped for a waterfront development uh, along the edge of the screen with a dock and a float. And we're between the water and Bay Street. And so we've identified some sort of guiding principles for the design work. Um, this blue dashed line is sort of interesting. It's it's traces the line of the original pre-development shoreline in Port Orchard. That's where the shoreline was pretty much right along the edge of what we know as Bay Street today before uh, land was filled and, and um, downtown was built. And we think this is um, an interesting thing to note. And um, we are going to position our building sort of uh, between the water and the land um, on a piece of property that um, in fact was over water at one point. And that gives all kinds of interesting um, inspiration for design. Uh, we see a plaza here where people are really introduced to the waterfront and the waterfront trail system right near our entry, a really dynamic setting for the entry to an event center and a library and the opportunity to do some storytelling with these uh, story walls that you'll see um, when Mike gets to those pieces. And hopefully the idea of sort of an urban forest uh, that helps create this entry experience to, to the event center. Oh, well, Laurie, let's go to the next one. <clears throat> one of the things that we're doing um, between Bay Street and the water is negotiating some sea level rise. And so we are right in, right in the middle of determining what the finished floor elevation for the library, which is the main level of the event center, um, will be, and then how to enact grades around it so everything comes out um, just so. So we think there'll be about three feet of grade between Bay Street and the new community center, which um, surprisingly is not too different from the current situation with the existing Kitsap Bank headquarters. If you know that, there's kind of a slope from Bay Street up to their footprint. So this will be closer to Bay Street and we'll have more front yard out on the water side. Um, we are just now getting our subconsultants, meaning civil, structural, mechanical, electrical, and landscape and transportation involved. And um, I do these kinds of things to help guide the rest of the design team. And what's interesting about this project is I believe that the formation and the design of the site, the land around the building footprint, is just as important to the success of this facility as the building itself. Um, we have this really unique setting uh, at the Big Bend on Bay Street, and we positioned the building to pay attention to four different sides for four different reasons. We have our entry experience on the landward side. Uh, this, is, this is the great welcome center. On the water side, we have this beautiful opportunity for a waterfront porch. And so really this, this building has two entry sides, the way we see it. 
a water entry side and um, a landward or Bay Street entry side. And we're giving those equal weight in design. This building needs to really be welcoming and functioning, whether you're going by in a car, you're coming for an event or you're walking on the trail or you're coming by boat. Um, all of those things are important. And then on either end of the building, um, our southern end, the southwest side is kind of our recreation focus that we've talked about before and where both the event center and the library will service themselves from. So there's a lot of loading and unloading here. And then on the north side, the city is doing a new pump station up there. So we're coordinating that effort with this effort, ending up with a very usable plaza there too. So we really got usable space on all sides of the building. Um, a larger front porch on the water and a smaller one, but just a really cool active one on the street side. I think we need to, we need to make sure that this building is active inside and out and on all sides. So um, where does design inspiration come from? Uh, we're kind of looking back in history here on the left is a picture of downtown Port Orchard along Bay Street over a hundred years ago. And you'll see, you know, most things built out of wood they have uh, uh, the kinds of roofs that shed water, um, common sense for our area. And then if you fast forward um, to 2015, you know, most of the buildings that we see on Bay Street today, they don't really address the water. Um, what we had before was sort of industry, water facing and industry. And what we have today is street facing and commerce. These buildings, by and large, turn their backs on the waterfront and um, address each other. This piece of town, Bay Street, could be, could be anywhere, almost, the way it's situated. And our goal, of course, is to use these things as inspiration, but look beyond them and create a building that really embraces the waterfront and its street-facing location. Lots of color here. Most of the buildings, two or three stories. This is all contextual for us. Um, uh, some of these buildings uh, have false fronts, kind of a holdover from the old days, uh, trying to be bigger than they really are. It's an, it's an interesting street and a very well-contained downtown. I like this quote from city council. Uh, are we honoring the past but not living in the past is one of Port Orchard City Council's guiding principles. And it's an interesting one for us to take off on. So that leaves us with the future. And the next slide, um, where do we find inspiration? What feeds design? Uh, what's the big idea for the project, for a strong and pur purposeful solution? We're really interested in the story of place. We have this very unique site right on the old original shoreline in a very visible location. We, um, are finding inspiration from the idea of porches on both sides. And of course our goal is to energize this piece of the master plan in Port Orchard, this very important end of town on the water where a combination of uses, this is where Port Orchard will come together in South Kitsap to learn, um, to work and to celebrate. I'll turn it over to Mike, who is our lead designer and can walk you around the building. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, so I've got a series of images here that we're going to kind of spin the building along. Um, and some things to take a note is, like what Steve was saying, we haven't really cut loose with our landscape and civil engineers. Um, so everything kind of outside the building is a is a pretty rudimentary uh, direction that we're heading in, um, but we, we still haven't gotten into the finer details that those uh, those disciplines would offer us. But um, you'll get the you'll pretty get a good idea of what we're intending to to have surrounding this building here. So this first image here is on the is on the northeast corner on and it's it's the camera is situated in a place called uh, what we are calling Orchard Street Plaza. And so we're looking southwest. There's the 7-Eleven building across. Um, we have Bay Street on the left and, and the Puget Sound on the right there. And this is kind of the main entrance. And that's kind of the, the urban forest that Steve was talking about in the site diagram of this kind of um, 
big canopy that comes out to the street and really is a welcoming um, welcoming place for people who are walking by or driving by. Um, and then we have this story wall element, which is mirrored on the other side of the plaza in front of the pump station. So some sort of attractor and, you know, we can, we can talk about where that might go, but it's, uh, it's something to interact with um, as you, as you move your way around the building. So you want to go next slide there. Um, this is just a street uh, level view. So you can see down low on your right is the, is the program room for the uh, library space that'll open up onto that plaza. Above that, we have a very generous deck with lots of views and that comes out of the pre-function space for the event space that uh, Angie can tell you about. So lots of spaces outside. Next slide. Um, here's the water side. So we have an indication of the shoreline, which will be vastly different than what is in there now. Um, outside the building on this elevation, we have an idea of a, of a shelter, which could be used in conjunction with other temporary shelters to host events. Um, we have lots of different uh, outdoor spaces, decks, um, an idea about a outdoor movie screen. You know, we're on the north side of the building. It will get darker a little earlier. Um, wouldn't it be fun to pull your, your boat up and watch a movie? Um, that would be something kind of interesting. Um, that Oculus element on the top, that corresponds with something inside the building uh, in an atrium space. So that's something that'll really catch your eye from far away um, and kind of lead you, lead you into the building. So next slide there. Uh, this more water side. So kind of just looking at how it's long and low um, has an interesting profile. Um, it's going to be, it's going to be a big statement on the shorelines at Port Orchard. So this, this whole area out front is kind of where we intend to, to host any of the expanding events that are happening inside the event center. And Steve and Angie will talk a little bit more about how that lays out in plan. All right, next slide. And then this is for, uh, this view is down on the, the float for the, uh, for the kayaks float. Um, so you could, you could approach the building from the water. You could come in, kayak up, park your kayak, or actually push it up onto the beach um, and then approach from that area. So all different kinds of opportunities for people to have um, a way to get to the site and interact with these the other areas. So next slide there. And so here we are looking north. This is kind of the business end of the building where we have our event loading, our library loading, um, which is the parking lot that we share with the, the 7-Eleven there. Um, but then also a, a huge amount of, of access to the beach. So that's, that's um, gonna be a big side of the, of the building there. Our right, next slide. Um, this, is a, this is a deck uh, on, the, on the north side, the, or the north, uh, I keep getting my sides confused. This is the southwest side, Port Street Plaza. So we have a small room on the upper floor we're calling the Light Lab, which is kind of a collaborative space for the library and it will have an outdoor space and can be used in conjunction with uh, the event spaces upstairs. So kind of a hybrid model. Um, next slide there. There's our Bay Street. So we're, we're trying to draw from the context with, with, with color um, and materials and um, that's about Starts it there. And then, then a down low view from, from street level. So that's kind of what you'd see as you approach the building if you were in that development just, uh, just across Bay Street as you come down from the hill. All right, I think uh, I'll let Angie talk a little bit about the floor plans that we've drawn up. Yeah, sounds good, thanks, Mike. <clears throat> so I wanted to take you inside the building now that we've taken a look at all sides. Um, just to orient you really quickly, we are in plan view here. To the top of the page, we've got the water side, 
bottom of the page is the Bay Street side. Um, now the library, as you saw in the 3D views, is a two-story building. Uh, the intent is that the lower level would service the library primarily, and the upper story would service the event spaces. Uh, Lori, would you just go ahead and point at the front door? So right there is our main entrance. That's what you saw in the 3D views Mike showed where you approach from the Port Orchard Plaza side um, up into the building. Uh, when you walk in that front door, you heard Mike talk about something called an oculus. So straight in front of you, uh, there's a two story height space right off the bat that's introduced upon first entrance. Um, we're not sure exactly what that Oculus is going to look like yet, but we think it's going to be a really cool feature that you can experience from both the lower floor and the upper floor. Now, if you're a, a guest for an event, uh, you're going to walk in this front door and immediately to your right, there's an elevator and a um, large, beautiful stairway that will get you up to level two. So that would sort of be your route heading upstairs. Lori, would you go ahead and take us to the second floor? Okay, moving on up, you might come off that elevator space and right in front of you, you're greeted with, uh, number one, you're gonna see a big expansive view looking out to the water. You're also going to see that double height space that sits between levels one and two and creates that Oculus experience. And then around you, you'll, you'll see there is quite a bit of um, what we're calling pre-function space. Now the pre-function space is really important to events. It's the stuff that helps us um, with queuing. It helps us with spill out in certain meetings so we can extend the um, flexibility and use of some of the enclosed spaces. Um, just to walk you through the meeting spaces that are shown in the plan, um, I guess, Lori, would you go up to the largest meeting room, which is middle of the page, correct? So this is the largest event space that we've got in the upper floor. Uh, it can be divided into two medium-sized spaces, but fully extended, um, it can serve up to, uh, I guess, over 200 people for, say, a um, theater event or some sort of lecture type scenario. With a uh, dining experience, this could seat anywhere from 100 and beyond if you flex out into some of that pre-function space and you can see tables sprinkled out there and imagine yourself um, there for maybe a reception or a dinner. Um, we've also got some smaller spaces that are shown uh, down at the lower part of the plan, that's correct. Um, these right now are servicing, as I mentioned, smaller meetings. So these can be um, you know, six to eight people. I think in some of our newer plans, we're exploring an option where we have a couple small ones that seat six to eight but one in the middle that can seat a larger group of people for say a board meeting or um, some sort of larger group activity where they wouldn't need the largest space in the event center, but, um, but kind of that medium point. A couple other things to note, uh, there's some really amazing access to outdoor space up here. So from a um, event standpoint, stand place, you know, we, we always wanna be able to access the views and get outside, have that indoor outdoor experience so Lori's pointing to a couple of outdoor decks, a couple that are directly off the ocean side um, and some that are more towards Bay Street with that urban experience. Now Lori's over on the far end of the building towards the south and there's that light lab that was mentioned. This space is meant to be a pretty flexible space. It can operate as a, um, what we call a light lab, which is a learning innovation, uh, technology and education center but it can also act as a meeting space. So um, it becomes very ambidextrous in this, in this situation to keep everything kind of activated throughout all hours of the day. Uh, just a couple other things to note that are more functional. We've been thinking a lot about our restrooms up here, making sure we're, we're meeting capacity. Um, we don't want it to be too close to some of those main event spaces, but not too far either. Um, we've also got a few spaces dedicated to uh, a catering kitchen right now and some equipment storage space. Now we've been in cahoots with Columbia Hospitality and they've given us some good feedback. There is some conversation happening right now about what, what does that kitchen element want to be? Is a catering kitchen um, going to be our best option or does it need to be a commercial kitchen? So we're in conversations about that right now. 
just a couple other logistics to know. You know, we have started thinking about trash and where that will get out of the building. It'll go down a chute that leads down to level one that can be easily accessed off that service end of the building towards the south. So in all kind of, all in all, I guess, meeting size for up here, we're really looking at about 7,000 square feet of meeting and pre-function space. And if you count in the decks, we're looking about, you know, seven or 85 to 9,000 9, square feet of indoor outdoor usable meeting space. So that's, it's pretty wonderful. Um, Lori, would you move to the next? Thank you. So this is just some diagrams we did um, on the right hand side of the page. There's a bunch of information and, and I'm not going to go through all of that today. You guys have this in your package, but, um, but what we're really wanting to convey with this slide is just to show you all the options that we're going to have for meeting space specifically. So in the two plans that you see on the left hand side of the page, the lower plan is level one. And you can see in the far corner, far north corner, we've got a program space that, as Mike mentioned, that's that can have a roll-up door that kind of spills out onto the, the Port Orchard Plaza. Um, that's going to be a really lovely experience as you um, walk through there on the trail. You can see what's happening. Maybe you see kids in there um, having some fun activities. When we go upstairs to the upper plan at the top there, um, again, there's those the meeting rooms that I mentioned um, identified as D at the bottom. Those are the small meeting rooms that we've got um, that again will change in the middle to a larger uh, meeting space with a couple of small. So a few, few tweaks that are coming. In the dead center of that, we've got our large meeting space that can be broken into two spaces. Um, on the far left, we've got C where we've got our light lab opportunity. And then I just wanted to take a quick second and talk about the area we are identifying as E. This is kind of a fun, uh, creative way to use some open pre-function space you know, we see this as being very versatile. It can, um, like shown in plan, be, be used as additional seating for an event, but uh, this could be used in a lot of different ways. You know, perhaps there's a, I don't know, a yoga class, a senior yoga class that wants to use this during the day. This is a space that would have wonderful views. Um, you've got a double height space that still connects you down to that lower level. So the building just really feels visually connected to both the inside and the outside, but to each floor. I think, Steve, do you want to talk through this slide? Yeah, just quickly. Um, our goal here is to design a building that can, uh, I guess to use a popular phrase, can, can punch above its weight a little bit. Um, we're trying to make um, the upper and lower floors integrated and for any user to have uh, access to some really great space and as much of it as possible. We know that we can't simply design a building to um, match the number of seats, say, at competing centers like the one in Bremerton. Um, but it, we want to make this sort of just right for this part of the county. We think it can be uh, an attractive location from a much greater distance because of all the amenities that it offers. Um, Event centers are experiences. They need to be memorable experiences. And so you can see that we packed a lot of features into a relatively small building. Lots of ways to get outside, a central space in the middle with a unifying element, something really wonderful, a conversation starter. Um, how wonderful will it be to, to have everyone in the building kind of rallying around that. But an event center, if we take um, some of the ones that might be typically controlled by the library and blend them in, we all of a sudden go up to 11,000 feet of event space. And that's really great. Uh, likewise, if there isn't an event going on, KRL can program some of the event space and um, get their hands around almost 17,000 square feet of space. So, what we like about this is that quite a few of the pieces and parts of this building can be used flexibly. Um, so again, don't think of the building as strictly a library on the main and strictly an event uh, uh, space upstairs. It largely is that, but can really do a lot more. 
Lastly, you know, we just wanted to walk you through a couple of these. Um, we're starting uh, what are called activation diagrams. How do you really use the building? And <clears throat> Columbia Hospitality has been working with us on this. We have this amazing front porch and not too many event spaces have a front porch like this um, around this kind of big major uh, community fire pit out there. Um, we have this uh, sliding shed that Mike talked about that we can move uh, up and down in front of the building and position it where we want. And in this case, uh, uh, we could use it for a bar for um, an annual crab feed for 240 people in tents set up where you might pre-function inside the building and then have a major setup outside because we can't get 240 in the building and we never intended to we wanted to show you that there are ways to use pieces and parts of the building and what's around it to just have a really memorable experience to draw a lot of action. And that's super important. Um, the next one shows how we would use the building in a progressive manner. So if you can follow the purple arrow for a minute, Lori has her cursor down on the purple arrow. There's a welcome to a progressive event. It's a black tie gala at the Port Orchard South Kitsap Community Event Center. And there are greeters uh, staged outside the door. And after you enter, there's a formal greeting where you may be greeted and you get your name badge, you might get your auction packet. And from there, you go outside to the shed, which is positioned in the middle of the front yard at this point and there's a pre-function going on outside. When that's finished, you go back up into the building and arrive at the second floor. And um, we have more milling around space and tables set up to have um, a buffet style dinner for say 120 with a head table more if you use the pre-function area for seating, which you could do in this case because you already had a pre-function outside downstairs. So just see how many ways that you can use this. Maybe when that's over, the event also includes um, uh, an evening event after dinner down at the fireside uh, after party event down by the fire pit. And at that point, perhaps the shed is moved down to the left and, and acts as a, as a post-function bar or something like that. So that's kind of it for tonight. I think, um, Lori, is there anything else? We, we, we wanted to, to come tonight, not just to show you sort of how the plans work, but to leave you with the impression that we're really thinking hard about how many ways this building can be used and by how many people. And while it's, it's interesting to think about how it could be used as a community center or a library, its real intent is to attract business to Port Orchard. This is a revenue producing building. The event spaces and what's inside and around them is critically important because this needs to be a really, really desirable location. We think that the kinds of experiences we're designing into this at the setting that we have, it's almost like you can't miss, but we're really working hard to create um, just an event center that people will really like coming to, that the operator can sell and sell it all day long because that's gonna make it work. And we look forward to uh, coming back and seeing you again. I know there'll be some feasibility work up ahead, which will describe how much business we think this facility can do. But uh, I wanna thank the team, I wanna thank the mayor and Nick, of course, for their guidance. And um, we really are making great progress. We're just having a ball designing this building. It's a super fun building. And I think it's going to play out that way in real life. Um, and we're open to your questions for the design team anyway, um, unless the mayor would like to take it from here. We'll hang on, of course. Certainly. You know, I'm, I'm really excited about how far we've come. And I just, if I could get some feedback from you guys and in, in your initial thoughts. And then I've got, uh, uh, I'll talk about the real estate transaction a little bit if I could. So Darren, you, 
your group have any questions? Or yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the first question. Uh, spatially, uh, just to kind of get a reference point for me, how long is the building, how wide is the building when we're looking at it for the rough scale? I've got that. You would ask that question tonight. <laughs> uh, the building is about 200 feet long. And let me see here. It's probably around 60 or 70 feet wide. Nope, only 55 feet wide. 55. Okay. So it's a very, yeah. very narrow and long building. Thank you. Thank you. It looks great. Other, other questions from the board or feedback? I do. Um, the lift station, is that servicing more than this one building? It lift serves station. the... Yeah, it I'm serves sorry. the whole city of Port Orchard from McCormick oh, yeah. Woods, and it's it's currently there, and uh, it, it's uh, it's a thirteen million dollar project to rebuild, and it'll happen just ahead of this project. It's critical infrastructure, and it's mostly going to be underground. And it'll have a building and, and some public restroom uh, on it, also, so that we is, is much needed on the waterfront too. We don't want everybody. Um, walking down the street, coming into the community center to use the restroom. We'll have one outdoors and just outside the door. Great question. Uh, Mayor, are there state or federal grants or, or federal money that help with that lift station construction? Uh, we have a loan on that. And fortunately, it's, uh, it's, it's, called, it's part of our enterprise funds. So the sewer connection fees and uh, sewer rates will pay for it. So we don't have a, we don't have a grant, but we have a $13 million loan uh, to build that. Thank you. But and Steve so, talked about uh, that screening too, and the importance, I mean, it's there, but we don't want to see it and we, as much as we can. And, and it's going to be an attract as, as attractive as it can be. There's one in Gig Harbor that's very nice with split block and we're, we're not going to you know, put an eyesore out the, on our front porch. I heard it. Another question. the design that the beach uh, you guys had, I think kind of by the, the um, what do you call it, out of the water for the kayaks. Tell us a little bit about that. Is that going to be imported? Is that going to, you know, be a usable thing? Is it kind of a, a couldn't well, get dimensions on the size of that beach or what it, what the materials were uh, going to be used? Is it going to be a sand, kind of a, more of a sandy beach? Or is it going to be more of our, what we typically have here with a kind of a rocky, more native look? To, to well, this point, we, we, there's just concepts because we don't, uh, your, we're not using any of your funds to uh, do to design plazas, street frontage, or the shoreline restoration. Sure. Your funds are only being used on this building. And until and I promised my city council I wouldn't bring any contract. I've got scope and notion. Uh, uh, I've got a scope negotiated for those other elements, and it's about two hundred thousand dollars to design those other elements. And so we have ideas, but they're not designs yet. And uh, as soon as we're under contract on the property, we will uh, will execute those contracts and start that those design processes and uh, and have something more tangible than our than our concepts. Steve, you have anything other, other to share on that? Yeah, thanks. Um, the mayor's right. It's it's a little early to know um, what we all suspect in order to make this work is that largely what we see there now is, you know, there's a big bulkhead that holds up Kitsap Bank. And in order to earn mitigation credit, we'll need to return the shoreline to contain elements that you would have seen um, on the shoreline before in the best way that we can. Obviously, because the shoreline was way back up against Bay Street, we can't return it to a completely you know, natural setting, but we can emulate some of that and near shore plant um, native species, that sort of thing, and help the beach become friendlier for migrating fish. Um, so our team eventually does include a shorelines biologists and a shorelines engineer at KPFF, uh, who will eventually be designing um, what this restoration looks like. And of course the mitigation for that allows us to, to 
bargain for some of these wonderful overwater um, use use pieces like the a dock and a float. Um, that's over DNR property, which of course abuts this. And DNR is all about, of course, um, access to the waterfront for people. So I think it's a it's a great scenario. And you know, there's a project, if you want to Google it, there's a project under construction, different beach entirely in Edmonds. Um, mm -hmm. It may be finished now. Uh, they're building a waterfront center, and some of the renderings show sort of the advanced version of what you might see from us later with um, more natural grasses, some soft beach armoring, that sort of thing. Again, they don't have quite as much um, vertical to deal with as we do, but it's a good indicator of what can be done. Great. Thanks. Other questions or comments? Okay. Take the opportunity, quick, Mayor, to just uh, say I get to see under the hood being part of the steering committee, and uh, Mayor Putanzu and uh, Steve and his team are doing a great job. Uh, I've enjoyed learning about the process as well. So thank you for letting me be part of the ride. Yeah. Thank you for participating. You've been, been a valuable member of our steering committee. Yeah. <laughs> so on the, on to the real estate. Um, and I'm not looking for any type of an action this evening. I'm just trying to I'm going to give you some information of where we're at in the real estate negotiations. City Council uh, is going to get this presentation and get uh, we're going to talk about the purchase and sale agreement tomorrow night. And I just want to hit the high points of this purchase and sale and where we're at with the bank. And so that I can, if I've got heads nodding here, I can share that with my city council because when we get this purchase and sale negotiated, the we're going to need to modify the ILA for the, the execution dates between the, the, the purchase and sale and the and uh, our construction. And the bank needs to continue to reside in this building as they design and construct their building. And they're they're not wanting to do a lot, you know, spend significant dollars until they sold their piece of property. And so where we're at uh, tonight, you know, we went through an extensive uh, community process to determine this site. Unfortunately, we also selected the most expensive piece of real estate on our waterfront. And uh, had an, we had an appraisal done. It appraised for $3.9 million. And if you're familiar with the ILA, we have $1 million from the Public Facilities District for real estate. So don't worry, I'm not here to ask you for more money. I've solved it already. So I've uh, I've already solved this. I've got uh, the current draft agreement calls for a purchase of price of $2.5 million. But the bank would like to lease the property back during the, after we sell it to them for 42 months is what they're asking. What we've, they started at five years. I've got them down to 42 months from when we close the, uh, and then, so they will get their valuable, some of their valuable consideration back in the lease uh, by us not charging them to lease the building back from them. So um, they're also asking, uh, and Brian will probably correct my grammar, uh, force majeure language related to extensions. They're asking for three uh, one-year extensions after the 42 minutes for catastrophic events. Um, you know, war, the next pandemic, the zombie apocalypse, God knows, and we've had a tornado already. We've checked that one off the box in Port Orchard. So that's what, so that, that's what where we're currently at with the bank. And they're pretty, they're, they're conservative bankers. They're pretty insistent on having, uh, some consideration with that. Um, our current ILA has us getting the million dollars from you guys about 18 months from now. And so what my, one of my ask is, is that uh, if I, when we come back to modify this is to access, I have a straight state grant that I received for $1.2 million to cover some of this gap. And I, I have access to that money in July. So anytime thereafter, when your cash flow could allow it, we'd like access to that 
your million dollars so we can close and start the clock on the bank's 42 months. So the sooner we close, the sooner we get rolling on this thing. Realistically, we're, you know, counting some real estate negotiation times here. We're probably four years from breaking ground on this project uh, and to have the design here done in about a year. Um, City is committed to the, the uh, covering the funding gap. And as I spoke to, uh, we've already negotiated scope on designs for the uh, the plazas, the streetscape. We have a street sea level rise report that tells us we need to raise the street a couple of feet. Um, and uh, so we'll be uh, taking that on too. But uh, so that's, that's where we're at. And I just wanted some feedback from you. So when I go back to the city council, uh, whether what what I'm where we're at in the go negotiations to the bank are if you, if you have any heartburn with what anything you've heard. Uh, members of the board, any comment? Well, you're on mute. Hey, well, um, for either Brian or or Mike or for both of you under the current. ILA, when were we supposed to cough up the real estate purchase money? About 18 I'm, months from now. Okay. So we're moving that up by year and a half. year or more. Yeah, about a year, possibly. If you're, whenever your cash flow can afford it. So uh, go ahead, Aaron. I'm, I'm just I'm a little confused about how, when we were looking at our entities bonding and versus us paying for the bonding fees, at what point is that coming in versus paying out of cash flow? I don't think I've ever heard us really discuss this. Can you, who are you looking to answer that? And can you rephrase it? Cause I wasn't sure. Okay, so yeah. And, and as mayor said, you know, we're talking about paying this out of cash flow. And when we've looked at these bigger projects, we've made sure that our public entities can also bond for it. And the idea being we're not bonding and pulling the cash out. We're paying back the bonding fees. So, I mean, like this is just a million towards the rest of it. But at, at what do we have a point in the ILA where we say, OK, now you go and bond and get your big lump of cash and we start paying back the bonding? Or is that addressed in the ILA? That's not in the ILA. I, you know, there's there's a whole series of, of events uh, that are in the ILA, um, but the ILA is is cash dependent. That is, it's it's for for every event, it's subject to availability of funds from the PFD. I, Mayor, go ahead. Mayor. I, I guess to answer, we're, we're going to be two years farther out than we anticipated. I think when we entered, part of it is COVID driven yeah. and part of it is uh, the banks in our way. And so um, I would hope, uh, you know, this design phase and the real estate, I believe were anticipated from your cash flows. And then when we got to the construction phase, that's where the 9 million for the construction was intended to be uh, debt. I would hope that if we're two years, you guys have two more years of collection, uh, that the amount of that debt, it, that you would hold that money and not spend it somewhere else. It would be, isn't, that's the thought in the back of my mind. Yeah. And then the amount of the borrowing potentially is less because you're, you're, you're holding the cash for us. But, uh, you know, th there's nothing... Uh, written or uh, you know, it doesn't, the ILA doesn't address that. Okay. But that, that's exactly what I was looking for. I mean, what, what was our game plan? Was it just when you go to start actually building, that's the point, the bonding point. So, okay. Yes. Thank you. That, that was the plan. I quali qualify this by saying that I, I believe by our next meeting, um, our financial advisors are going to have, kind of a, a more detailed understanding of cash flow and pinch points for us as we work with different projects and as we, um, as we pay different projects. Uh, but my view, Mayor Patamsu, has always been that you're our number one project and the ranking of the projects to me matters. Uh, it's not just that people pass through the gate or projects pass through the gate, but that 
our commitment was to, uh, you know, you are our number one project. And so uh, we would certainly work to make that payment sooner uh, to help you accomplish the goal that we set out with you uh, to do. So that would be my point of view going into it, that uh, you're, you're in a lead position um, for cash flow. And my understanding is that right now we have three point something, 3.5 million. Is that correct, Mike? Yes, that's about the number, 3.5, 3.6. And that's, that's beginning to erode a little bit as we're beginning to pay invoices for all the projects. My, my understanding, though, of the large-scale payments that we would be making, though, wouldn't interfere with being able to uh, work with you uh, for the million dollars sooner. That would be my sense of it. And Mike, do you agree with that sense uh, as far as a uh, cash flow perspective? Well, I think we were in pretty good shape if we weren't going to have to do that until 18 months from now. Um, doing it within six months or nine months from where we are now, uh, there would be a lot of shuffling of money. And <clears throat> I'd have to take a look and with uh, the financial advisors and see what can be done and how to do it. The, um, the only other thing I would suggest, since we were able to arrange a... Um, pay up front by the port and pay them back later over time, whether something like that could be worked out with the, uh, with the city where instead of taking, you know, a million dollars up front, we could do it over four years, a quarter of a million a year or something and, and achieve the same thing. But, some balance and give and take. So we'll Why see. Why I ask the bank for that favor? Yeah. <laughs> it would um, it would seem like we will give you uh, better information to as soon as we're able to talk with our financial advisors. And so for the board too, that's something that we plan to do at this next meeting. We had intended to even have that information uh, for this meeting, but we got pushed back on that a little bit. But um, uh, we'll have even clear understanding for the board where we're at financially and for cash flow purposes, and then we can give you more concrete understanding. Um, but I would say in that general head nod sense that, you know, you are a number one uh, project. Here's, here's my thought here. So what the dates I'm working towards with the bank are, a September 1st, having all of our due diligence work done uh, or before. And I think we could probably have it done here in a few weeks. We're, we're darn close, environmental and all of those things. And we were looking towards a December 15th closing date or sooner. The reason I want sooner is the 42 months starts on the bank. So the sooner we close, the sooner, you know, I'm pushing them off the shore to action. If I potentially, what if I got the bank to accept, because we're looking at a three and a half year agreement. If I got the bank to accept three payments, um, you know, one at closing, one a year later, and another one, so roughly $333,000 or something of that and change with that. So think yeah. about that, Mike. And, that, and, that would be more digestible. Yes. Okay. So I, I will Based on that our economy bank. continuing in the direction it's going now, which is quite robust for us. Okay. I, I think that um, I'm speaking for somebody who's not here, but sure sounds That's swell to me. Understood. So, all right. I, I think I've got some thoughts that uh, are at least from you guys, you need to look at your cash flow. I, I, I think I have something I can work with here. And maybe in a month, uh, at your next month, your meeting next month, uh, we'll be we sharing uh, the purchase and sale with you and, and a proposed amendment to, to the ILA to, to make sure, because these things have, I don't want to, we just don't want to continue touching this thing. We want to make sure we touch this one last time and it's married to the dates that are in the purchase and sale for performance by us and the bank. So, so when would you want to come back again next month? 
we, we, I probably with documents and not a presentation, I hope. Gotcha. So when would you want the money? When would be the date that you would want? It? When you can afford to, I, I, I have my state. Money. Well, I mean, what's your, what's your timeline on this? This, the, is uh, it September 15th or is it December or September yeah, 1st or, or is it December you need to admit it before that? I have access to my state money in July. So anytime in July to December, when you're ready, I could move. And, and the, why I want to move sooner versus later is I'm trimming. I'm going to, I'm getting us to construction sooner versus later. So the 42 month clock starts as soon as you give them the money. As soon as we close. Okay. So I have a question about the construction phase and given that we have a unforeseen uh, incredible increase in the cost of building materials um, and you know, you're coming to us for extra money today. And I'm curious, have you built that in? And, and if not, is it, is it a, a likelihood or a potential that you're coming back to us again in the future for more money? Well, one, I'm not asking you for more money now. I'm asking to shift the timeline on the money that's already pledged. And we're committed to raising the money to build the, the I'm not going to ever come back for additional money. I, I can assure you of that. I am so thankful that we are not out to forbid right now uh, because <laughs> yeah. the world is crazy and it's got to settle down. Um, and, you know, uh, we've got we've got a $20 million facility as, as proposed, you're funding 12 million. There's about 8 million. I've already got another million five that I've already had to, to raise. And I've done that. And that was, it's difficult to get real estate money. People want, you know, your, your, your delegation Olympia, they want to cut ribbons. You know, there's nothing exciting about the, the million two I got from the legislature. It's I'm buying some dirt. And, uh, I'm very confident in my abilities to, to, to raise the additional money, the library. So we've got, for all intents and purposes, $8 million more, we hope, uh, that we have to raise. The library is committed to raising $5 million for this project. Uh, they have access to grants that I don't have access to, uh, to the state. And uh, the other million dollars is they, they're uh, going to need for their tenant improvements. So of the 5 million they're pledging to raise, they're going to put $4 million to the $8 million I need to raise. So I need to raise $8 million. I, we did a $23 million uh, Tremont project with almost everybody else's money. So, um, you know, the economy is robust. Uh, the city is in good uh, uh, financial condition and I'm confident in our ability to raise the money to, to see this project to this end. Any other comment or question from the board? All right. Okay. I hope Thank I'm you, back. Ms. Yeah. I hope I'm back seeing you next month because it means All I've right. got an agreement with the bank. Sounds good. I'll be in touch so that we can get you on the agenda if that's going to happen. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Let me take a moment to do some shifting. Next up on our agenda is item number five, uh, new business. Uh, first, uh, 5A is visit Kitsap. Uh, we've approved or asking for approval of an updated agreement. Uh, Brian, would you want to say anything to the changes that were made? Yeah, thank, thank you. I, I think the board approved in concept uh, uh, contract, but um, wanted to make sure I had I had seen the latest version because I hadn't seen it since January or something. Anyway, I did look at it. I made about seven what I'll call cosmetic changes. I, I updated the the recitals or the whereases, uh, made some corrections. Um, the, the payment process has, has changed from a voucher to an automatic monthly payment system. 
Um, and, and so that's, that's it. The, the, the substance, the guts of it didn't change again. It was more just f fine tuning some language. Okay, so at this point, we are ready then to uh, take a motion for approval of this. Is that correct? All right. Uh, do I hear a motion for the approval of our agreement uh, with oh. Ms. Kitsap? Thank you, Tom. A second? I'll second it. Thank you, Walt. Any comment it, or discussion? If, yeah. John? If this has been auto paid, has it been auto paid through COVID? Yes. Okay. It's been auto pay for four or five years, I guess, that we've been doing that, renewing the auto pay each year. Uh, the amount <clears throat> that's going for the annual payment, the 2000 a month is auto pay and the, uh, the rent has gone up from 950 that it was before to 1200 now. But that's not part of the uh, the the thing that's in front of us today. Correct. So the two thousand dollars that we pay monthly has been on auto pay. Correct. Okay. And I might just ask for. I know we got a, uh, a presentation by VKP last month. Um, I uh, I would just ask us to maybe see if we can look into those services provided for the last twelve months and the twenty four thousand that. Uh, this organization paid towards that and the outcomes of that? Well, no, 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 no. that's fine. If Yeah, I can report on what was done and, and they've continued to support us and mention us in their activities that they've been supporting for the rest of the county um, that you can do with stopping short of telling people to come here. Under the new agreement, when I read it, it looks like they're going to handle most of the event fund now, the advertising. Did we do that before? Yeah, no, we've worked with them with the event fund for some time. In other words, we, uh, we get people that come in and say, we want to do something. And uh, we send some of them directly to VKP <laughs> in order to work out a little more clearly about what it is they're trying to accomplish, what they have to do to accomplish that, and what, um, what they need to do to structure their proposal to have a better chance of getting funding from us. So they, we use them as a, as a resource, uh, as well as helping them with the advertising. So are they going to do all the advertising? Because we did that before, didn't we? Didn't we put it out there? No. Oh, it's we up didn't? To, no, it's up to the, uh, the individual organizations that are applying for money to do the advertising and marketing. We supply the, the money so that they can do a, a wider job of sowing seeds to get people to come from out of the area, not just from Kitsap County. I thought we put something in the paper or something advertising we had money available. So, oh, yeah. Uh, we have, we have, yes. There you go. Yeah. yeah. So, is the VKP going to do that now? The way I read that, I kind of kind of look like that. No. We're going to continue to do the advertising for that. Okay. Yeah. I just, I, I did some, some research on my own based off of the presentation presented last month. Um, just because they have a new ED, I'll support it this month, uh, when it comes, or, uh, this year when it comes to a vote. Uh, but if I don't see that added value in the future, uh, this is not something I'll support. Well, you'll, I think you'll see that because we're going to open up and they're already beginning to, uh, structure their advertising campaign to start advertising for people to come, come visit come across the water, come from out of state, come and see what we have to offer. So they're beginning to make that appeal based on the fact that the state's going to open up in June as forecast by the governor. Uh, any other discussion on this agreement? 
Okay, let's have a vote. All those in favor of uh, agreeing uh, to this updated agreement with Visit Kitsap, uh, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. All right. Uh, we will enter into this agreement again with Visit Kitsap. I uh, would like to bring in now Ryan Neumeister and Scott Bauer, uh, who are financial advisors, to give us an update on uh, bond refunding. Uh, welcome, Scott. Welcome, Ryan. The floor is yours. Huh. Good evening, uh, everybody. Again, Scott Bauer and Ryan uh, Neumeister, Northwest Municipal Advisors. Uh, so I think we wanted to provide you with an update uh, of a meeting, virtual meeting, earlier this uh, month with the uh, Kitsap County Finance Committee. So we met with them on uh, May 11th, along with Darren. Uh, we wanted to get some feedback from the committee and I guess make them aware of, of some of what we're looking at. Uh, we wanted to see whether they were interested uh, in refinancing the district's portion of the 2011 bonds. So as you know, they have those outstanding bonds, which financed other things at Kitsap County in addition to uh, refinancing uh, of some 2002 bonds, which again are associated with the uh, with projects that the district uh, is funding. Uh, and then we also wanted to get a sense from them of something that we talked to you last time we were in front of you uh, was in looking at the refunding, uh, did they have an opinion on how it's structured? So we showed you two structures uh, previously, one where we really didn't sh change the shape of the debt. Uh, it stayed at basically 2026, but we refinanced a small portion of it uh, to take advantage of the uh, state law extending the 0.033% uh, uh, sales and uh, use tax uh, rebate. Uh, so again, extending just a small portion of it or extending out uh, basically uh, all of it and making kind of a level debt service or an equal payment each and every year type structure out to 2041. Uh, so that was the feedback that we looked uh, to get from them. So I guess just a, a quick recap, you know, as we have mentioned, I think, as you know, uh, that the state law did change uh, and we can extend or the TFD can extend that uh, sales and use tax out for 15 more years, out to 2041 in your case. Uh, but that's only to the extent that there is regional center debt outstanding. And the regional center debt is either the original debt, so from 2002 refinanced in 2011, or uh, as we understand from uh, your bond council, that it can also be improvements to that regional center or debt financed uh, for improvements to that regional center. So I guess in either case, if it's extended out to 2041, then you can take advantage of it. Um, and then also as a reminder that the 2011 bonds uh, are callable starting December 1 of this year, uh, but that doesn't mean that it has to happen on that date. It's just the earliest date that existing bondholders uh, can be paid off. So again, it, it doesn't have to happen on that date. It can happen at a future date. And uh, kind of a, based on the feedback that we got from the finance committee, uh, they are interested in refinancing uh, those bonds. It's not, I don't think, their first priority. They have some other financing that they're looking to do uh, this year. Uh, plus, again, with the, the call date being a little later this year, I think it's something that they'll maybe focus on later this year or potentially even the, into next year. And from a call date standpoint, that's fine. Uh, they also provided feedback when we showed them the two scenarios, keep the debt the same with a little piece out long or stretch out the debt. Uh, they had a preference toward keeping the debt the same shape with a little piece out long. Uh, but as Darren mentioned earlier in this uh, presentation, we're going to come back to you at a, a later uh, board meeting because we'd like to revisit what we showed you previously, sort of the, again, the, the, sh the short scenario and then the stretched out scenario and how does that impact cash flow for your projects? So uh, I think that's the feedback I have. Ryan, did I miss anything? No, I think you covered it very well. Um, and, I, and I think that the, the other piece to that, and obviously the, 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 the county did essentially give a head nod toward, you know, being supportive of the PFD for what they've already been supportive of so far. And also, yeah, extending that portion out, which of course then gives you additional revenues, you know, long-term, which then can be leveraged by, you know, the partners that you have uh, engaged in or will engage in. Any questions from the board? What is our timeline 
for figuring this all out. So, so we, I think many of us were under uh, an erroneous assumption that this needed to be done uh, by the end of this year, that we had that kind of deadline of we've got to get moving on this uh, really quick. And I don't know where we came up with that exactly, but that's not the case. And so what Scott was sharing is that that December 1st date is the very earliest that we could do the refinance. It's not what we have to do the refinance by. It's not the drop dead date, it's the start date. And so when we met with the county and they said um, that they were, um, you know, potentially uh, interested in doing this, um, you know, it just, it's not on the front of their list right now for their priorities for what the financing department is, uh, is working on. And so um, it seems like, and, and if we do it with the county to refresh you, which this was said too, but uh, if we do it with the county, um, we also, it costs us less money. We get a, we get a better rate. And so we have more money to put into projects. And so it seems uh, wise and good to uh, wait for the county uh, to come to the point where they're ready to refinance the 2011 bonds and then go along with them um, on that venture. Okay. Yeah, I think I had written down that it had to be after September, but before the end of the year, and I don't remember why. Right. And that is incorrect. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Scott. Yeah, my only comment is that uh, with the additional information that we got from Port Orchard, wanting to pull in their need for additional funding, um, I was all for leaving it in place and only putting a little piece out at the end of the 2041 period. Uh, I'm more in favor now of doing the full uh, refunding uh, out for the whole amount over the 20 years, because uh, that would bring our debt service, our current debt service of over $800,000 down to a much lower level and would uh, allow us to accumulate cash faster and be able to be in a better position to work with Port Orchard about that uh, real estate purchase. Yeah, and I just, Mike, I just wanted to correct something you had said. They came in for additional funding on it, but I think the mayor was uh, pointed out that this is just a move up on timing. This was not additional funding he's talking about for that million dollars. No, yeah, I that's, recognize that's, it's a move up, but we didn't have to face that for a year. No, understood. It's, it's now versus 18 months from now. Yeah, I just didn't want the records to show that we said it was additional funding, just timing. Yeah, I think that's an important um, way to frame the conversation, to use that language of that it is moving it up. It is not additional funding. No. We should be careful with that. Uh, Scott, is there anything else that you wanted to say? Well, the only thing I want to address, uh, the recollection of a September 1st date uh, is correct. Uh, so that date was the earliest date that you could actually issue and close bonds for those new bonds to be tax exempt. Now, what would happen is then those funds would be placed into an escrow until December 1 to pay off the bondholders. But that's, that's where the September 1st date came in. So again, the earliest date you could do it for tax exempt if you issue before that date, then the new bonds would be taxable and taxable bonds are more expensive than tax exempt bonds. But I think, you know, that's when we were talking about, you know, do we try to do it a little earlier or not, you know, back in December uh, at this point, uh, it won't happen until sometime after September one. So that point is, is now moot. Any other questions uh, that you have for it at this point? All right. Well, Scott, Brian, we thank you for your time. We thank you for the update. Uh, you've already heard uh, that there, it would be helpful to have that um, cash flow uh, figured out as soon as we can so that we can uh, give Port Orchard an understanding and just for us as a board to uh, determine how are we going to finance all the different projects. So I'll follow up with you for certain on that. We appreciate uh, your time tonight. Great. Thank you all. all right. Bye. Thank you.
All right, on to item number six, financial reports, uh, monthly reports. We, Mike, why don't you walk us through these? Okay, let me bring up my share screen here and we will get into that. Okay, looking at the uh, sales tax uh, rebate summary, let me shift you guys over to the other side of my board. 141,000, almost $500 received. Uh, again, um, since the pandemic, of course, that's 22% greater than last year, but uh, April of last, yeah, April of last year was the first down month in the uh, in the coronavirus effects. But the $141,000 is still the biggest amount that we've received in the month of April in our history. So that continuing record. Uh, is excellent for the state of the economy here in this county. Um, debt service, just under $70,000 is before. Um, our expenses up a little bit more, but the net a little over $50,000. Any questions on the rebate or any of the financials there? See. Yeah, Mike, I have a question. When, on these tax reports, not on the numbers, but is there any way, I'm always just curious with, I mean, I know that like restaurants have been closed and small businesses have suffered over COVID. Is this Amazon tax money that we're getting? I, exactly. I see John nodding his head. I, you know, it's just, it just makes me wonder. I mean, when, when people are out and about no longer sitting at home kind of couch potato shopping, I mean, are we going to be experiencing a, a drop off back to 2018 levels? Or are we just now so indoctrinated with shopping via Amazon that, you know, it's easy to point and click versus going to the store that, you know, once we go back to normal, the economy is going to go back up, but I don't know that we're going to be seeing these numbers again, unless again, like I said, we've been indoctrinated to just point and click. It, there, there's a lot of factors that are going to go into that. Uh, we've seen segments of the, of the economy that have been much higher uh, than expected in RVs and car sales and, and other things. We've always had a, a, a strong military component, and that's been buoying to us even when things are going down. Um, real estate has, has been crazy. Um, with car sales now, uh, you can buy a used car for the same price of a new car if you could find a new car. We don't know exactly what all of these different factors are going to mean. Um, but from what I've seen from the resilience of the economy, that I think we can still forecast that we're going to continue onward and upward. It may not be at quite these levels, but I think our forecast on our our forty year projection sheet are going to be pretty close to what we've been forecasting. So my, my question was just more: Do you get any reports that further break down the tax revenue in terms of any sort of demographics, like X percent online sales, you know, versus local, true local sales, or is it just here's your money and that that's what you get? Um, I haven't gotten into the weeds on that. I have had an, uh, an interview and a demonstration by the people back in Washington, D.C. called REMI that do uh, economic forecasting. And for $20,000 or something, they'll give you a model that we can plug numbers in and, and see what goes up and down and, and do all kinds of things with that. Uh, it, you, we, we may be able to do that on a, on a minor scale for six to $10,000. I don't know, but that's yeah. something that if you guys want 
better forecasting and, and better ability to plug things in and see what happens, that's available. I haven't taken advantage of it yet because you know, we've been able to stay within our per parameters and, and keep our forecast pretty much in line. So Mike, I think what he's asking is, you, we were given the number of 141,495.24 for that. Do they give you anything to that to say this dollar amount was from this kind of income, this dollar amount was that, or do you just get that number? I just get that number from the county. Um, I can ask and see if they have anything different. I'm sure they have some breakdown about the segments of the sales tax that they're receiving, some kind of understanding of that. But what we get is um, we get a bump sum from the state that comes back to the county as our portion of the sales tax rebate. Part of it goes into the 286 and the rest of it goes into the 977 account. And, and these are the numbers that I track. I think it, it really would be neat if you could get a breakdown of something, especially like you brought up real estate sales, because we all know what's happening with that right now. Um, and, and then if I can throw a little retail side to that, uh, what we're seeing to some degree, at least on a retail basis, has been stimulus checks. So remember, we're tracking two months behind and remember what was right. going on two months ago. And, um, you know, it, people were in a really good place at, in Kitsap County. I think a lot of, not everybody, there's a lot of people still really hurting, but for quite a few people, those stimulus checks were just extra money. So um, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm miss conservative when it comes to revenue. You know, so I'm not saying we're going off a cliff, but I'm also saying there's a little euphoria in here that I, I expect to settle a little bit. I hope I'm wrong. I hope it stays really high, but. It's a great point, Aaron. I suspect that will happen um, when those checks stop coming, but uh, we'll see Wait. what the rest of the economy is then when right. that happens. Well, and that's where if you got data and we found out that, you know, you yeah. know what percentage is from retail sales. I'll and ask and see what I can get yeah. from the county. And the, uh, the child tax credit begins to hit in July, I think it is, and that purportedly is bigger than the stimulus checks if you have children. Yeah. You got four or five children, you're in the tall weeds, boy. All right. What's next? Thank you, Valley. I'm here. I'm sharing the wrong thing. No, I, I think he still is going to go through the budget. Oh, I've, I've gone backwards. That's what the problem is. Okay. <clears throat> I have the uh, other information, and Susan is here with us, I think, Susan. Is, did, did she come in? I thought Yeah, I, I'm here. I'm okay, here. I did. I changed your status. All right. Uh, for whatever reason, it looks like part of my sheet is dislocated, but... Um, <clears throat> Go ahead, Mike. The, uh, the thing I wanted to point out in the operations uh, sheet, uh, the 968 expenses and so on, um, we'd made some adjustments in that. And <clears throat> Susan, I, I, yeah, up at the top, we had talked last meeting about adjusting how we present the budget. On, if you, I don't know if you can see the top of that form. Mike, where is the income or is it skewed? Okay, there we go, right there. Um, last time the budget was just evenly spread across the year. I've changed that to show the 180,000 that has been moved into 968 from 977 in order to have our operating funds. And then that leaves us 57,000 for the rest of the year. I'm estimating that around September or so we will do that, but I'll, I'll watch that so that it matches. We only need to transition it when we need more funds over in that account. But that was a suggestion from last time that we incorporated this time. And did you have a quick there? And then just the change in that liabilities there. This is just the same snapshots, tying all the 
and uh, this the projects is together. In the third column here, this is the, two, the 977 fund, um, shows around $3.6 million at this time. Um, if we continue adding 50 or $60,000 a month, we'll add another $700,000 or more. It's been 800 for the last couple of years. Um, so there's enough money coming in to, to probably cover what Mayor Patansu needs, but we'll have to look at balancing that against the other projects and where we are. And I have a sheet that will give us some idea about that. Okay, any questions about uh, the presentation on the budget from the board? I don't see all of you and I don't hear anything. So Mike, you would like to tell us about this funds flow sheet? <clears throat> yeah, uh, let me. Uh, I if, got... you, if you can do it as uh, briefly and quickly as possible, I'd like to uh, uh, get through the meeting and wrap it up. We're at an hour and a half right now. Okay. <clears throat> the, uh... You know, this is a little bigger than I wanted it to be, but basically this um, shows what Susan and I explained uh, last month <clears throat> where you can see the sales tax rebate is coming in, comes into 977. The debt service goes out to 286. The principal and interest gets paid twice a year. One thing we didn't mention is that there's also another set of bond funds <clears throat> that comes out in June and December on the 2015 bonds that fi helped finance the, the second increment of the fairgrounds bonds. That's about 20 to $23,000 a year. It's secondary to anything else. <clears throat> Most of what's in the 977 fund is in invested there is a portion of it that's in cash, and that is what comes out to do the operations funding and the transfers to the 966 account and the project funding that we're now paying out to the four different projects. <clears throat> and what comes out of the 968 is our expenses, contractors, event fund grants, and so on. There is a notation about miscellaneous income. When we hosted the KPF, I mean the PFD uh, annual conference here in the conference center, we got some extra money, but it, it's minor in, in regard to anything else. I just didn't want to skip a uh, an expense. All right, All right. thank you. Um, is it? Are we fine to go on to the blanket voucher? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to show you one other thing that uh, this is a second tool that uh, I've started using, which gives uh, a project funding record. Hey, Mike, if, if you use the negative in the middle of the screen, you might be able to do this. Go up straight right up there. Will that take it down? Yeah, there we go. But keeping track of how much money is going to the different projects. Right. So it Good. shows the first two phases of CNW. It shows what we're uh, down here, what we may be setting aside or approving. We approve those uh, later today that we can talk about. Here's the current stuff with the other three projects. Um, so that just gives us a record. And this will also feed into what um, Susan is tracking in, in her numbers. All right, thank you. Let's go on to the uh, blanket voucher approval. Can I have a motion uh, for approving the blanket voucher? So moved. Thank you. Who was that? That was Phil. I'll second. Aaron seconds. Any discussion on the blanket voucher? That's what was the, uh, 
the only comment I'd make is that we have our first invoice from Barker Creek for the construction consulting. This is a cumulated effect from uh, early in the year and also interlock solutions. This is the uh, first payment on work that's been done on the website upgrade. And this also covers work done earlier in the year with Patty working with uh, the two people that are working on this. And I'm taking over and working with them to finish off the website. How much is the website gonna cost when it's done? Uh, probably around six to $8,000. And that's part of the budget that we have out of the 24,000 for Visit Kitten? No, that's covered elsewhere. Let's see. Well, I won't go all the way back up there, but. Um, well, under Mike, the why don't you? Why don't you go back there and show where it's coming from in the budget? Okay. It's going to come out of. The 5419 other professional services. And <clears throat> obviously, I didn't budget enough for that. Although, let's see, we're talking about uh, yeah, the budget. Budget line item uh, 8, 20, uh, 5420. 5420 says the website, and that has a total budget for the year of $3,000. Will it be coming that. out of that? Yes. Okay. So that was under budgeted. Um, when Patty engaged in that, I didn't have a clear estimate of what I thought it was going to cost. I think that well, if I'm we look sure. at I'm, advertising I'm, and five four four one, there's six thousand dollars in that account as well. So far this year, we've only spent seven ninety five. If we combine the advertising and the website funds that are available, it should be able to take up any of the the shortfall. Just just my two cents worth from looking at where we are on the budget right now. Yeah. I'm going to ask us to refer back to last month's document on 2021 marketing support proposal from the Visit Kitsap uh, uh, Peninsula, the last uh, uh, bullet point, the VKP will assist the KPFD with guidance regarding the development of a new website content, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I just, I was confused as to what bucket of money we had deemed that to be part of now that I see this as an additional expense on top of that. Well, yeah, because <clears throat> Patty was basically acting on behalf of the PFD under her stipend of money, working with the web designers to do a lot of the basic structure and bones that the content is going to go on. And right now I'm editing the content in order to supply that back to the designers so that they can fit that into the new structure. That's going to be much less than what this has taken in order to get the, the new structure and layout and format done. So is there a point money-wise where this has to go out to a public process? Um, does that no, make sense? I'm, I'm not sure what it would, why it would have to be. And I don't know all the rules, but I mean, don't we have to do an RFP or something if we're going to contract for something like that? Um, Interlock Solutions and Chris Blair has basically been on the payroll to a very minor extent uh, during the 12 years that I've been here. And he's gotten a little bit of money. At, at one point, he was spending 100 bucks a year or something like that, maintaining the website. I took over doing that, um, and now he's involved heavily in the in the reconstruction of the existing website into a, in the, a new, uh, modern, responsive website. 
Yeah, so we didn't put this out for bids, though, or anything? No. no. Uh, basically, because the same people that, that put the, the initial website together, which was Chris on the technical end and Patty on the, the consulting side from design and coloration and so on and so forth, had put the original site together. They were still existing as a consulting team, so I utilized it. Yeah, but I mean, we had Brian go out for bids and we were still using him. I'm just wondering if that's as competitive as it should be, and I don't know. <clears throat> no, I didn't. The answer is no, I didn't use a, yes. an RFP process for doing this. I don't believe we have a policy around that. Any other comments or questions? I guess I'd say I probably won't vote to approve it unless that section of money is coming out of the 24,000. It's two different pieces, two different pots of money, but anyway. I do, I do think for an amount, that amount, it would have been good to notify the board before entering into a contract uh, with whoever we are paying um, and letting us know about that decision. Um, but I do think uh it is work that has been done at this point, and it's work that we've needed to be done. And hopefully, um, that will serve us well. Uh, any other comments before we call for a vote here? Just a quick, I'd just like to reiterate what Darren said. I think, unfortunately, I, I, I do agree with both John and Darren that I, on dollar amounts like this, I think we need to get approval ahead of time, but they have done the work. So I think we'd run into an issue if we say no. I agree with that too. I'm amenable to paying. I'm just going to take it out of the total budget that we set aside out of this 24,000. Yeah. Okay. Tom, did you have anything to share? I did. I just looked up real quick. The, the threshold is 25 K for RFP requirement. Okay. 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 Thank okay. you very much for that. Okay. I'm going to call, I'm going to call for a vote. All those in favor of paying the blanket voucher approval say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Oh, okay. Good. Blanket voucher is approved. Uh, moving on to um, uh, 6C project voucher approval for the Port Orchard uh, invoice. Uh, do we have one, Mike? We simply have a question mark for the agenda that I'm looking at. Oh, we have the. Uh, <clears throat> That's Paul's. No, we didn't have a, a, a Port Orchard one. <clears throat> I got it about uh, an okay. hour before the meeting. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> moving, moving on then for Paul's Boat Perk invoice for 15516 25 Can I have a motion to approve that invoice? So moved. Thank you, Phil. A second. All right. Uh, I hear Tom on that second. Is that correct, Tom? Yes. All right. And any discussion on this invoice? All right. Then calling for a vote. All those in favor of paying uh, our blanket aye. voucher, say aye. Aye. Um, aye. aye. Any opposed, say nay. All right. Thank you. And then uh, for the Port of Bremerton, uh, we have uh, a two-part piece here. Uh, basically, what they are asking us to do is uh, they, they know that we are going to reimburse them on the schedule that we've already said in the ILA of over 10 years. Uh, but as they have invoices come in, they would like to put them before us and have us see them and make sure that we approve that this is an invoice that we will pay eventually as part of that schedule of payments. Um, is there anything 
uh, Brian or Mike that you would like to add in at this point? Yeah, <clears throat> what I'd like to put before you is a brief statement uh, about the invoice approval process. We've discussed this with Jim at the port with Brian. Brian has reviewed the agreement, which we got a, a copy of late this afternoon. Um, says that the invoices that will be presented for approval it's been reviewed and is deemed to be in, in a valid condition. Uh, we have two of the invoices, and uh, my first recommendation is to approve these two invoices. I have reviewed them and determined they to be valid invoice, invoices for the appropriate work on the public portion of the Phase 3 uh, CNW project. And... The second is to go ahead and continue this process through to the end of the phase three work sometime in 2022. <clears throat> My second recommendation is to structure the repayment of the accumulated invoices by paying the first $144,000 payment at the end of the year the starting point of the ILA with the port was it signed at the end of February. So beginning March 1st of this year, the first payment would be paid at the end of February in 2022. So that's my recommendation on the review of the, the conditions under the port agreement with the contractor and what our agreement is with the ILA to pay them $144,000 a year for 10 years. Mike, can you bring up that invoice just so I can see what it's for? A little more. And has Shannon at Barker Creek been involved in reviewing these also? Not that I'm aware of. Brian and I have done that. Is that something, I mean, we've brought Barker Creek on as our consultant for our projects. It seems to me like it would be best to have them approve draws on, on items also. Agreed. I think that's a great point, Aaron. And um, I think it's also important for the board to be part of that process uh, in the same way that John serves with the South Kitsap conference and event center and, and I'm serving on the Polspo Perk uh, group and Pat is serving on the Port Gamble Heritage Park. I think we should have another board member uh, also be involved with the Port of Bremerton um, for this uh, funding as well, where you're part of the discussions that are going on and we have a board member who uh, yeah. knows what's going on in that in and those I, conversations. Yeah, and you had brought that up that if I would want to do that, and I absolutely agree to. I've I've talked to, um, I don't know if it was Jim and Brian both to say, as soon as you guys have any meetings, anything like that, I want to be part of them. Those haven't come up, but but I haven't seen these invoices either. So um, well, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Aaron. And that's wonderful. And we'll make sure that those invitations get extended and you get connected to those discussions. Um, what I have is the two invoices, one for 69000 the other is 86. What accompanies that is detail like this on uh, what it's being spent for and also a progress report that details uh, some delineation of what progress is are being made. Um, okay. I've recommended to Jim that Aaron be added to whatever meetings there are. I haven't been notified. I haven't seen of any notice of meetings, but Absolutely. we'll ask them to include us in the future. Um, can I ask something else? I saw on the, I just, yes, you know, I, have to, I have to run home to, to get to these meetings. So I'm sitting in one place and I saw that this came through from you, Mike, like just a, an hour and a half before the meeting, but it looks like it was dated last week. Is there a potential that if, I mean, the, the, the writing, the written up part was dated 519? Good. The, the narrative that they wrote. 
Anyway, what I'm saying is it's 524. Yeah, 518. Yeah. Could we have gotten that before this afternoon? I haven't even read it yet. Um, so I'm just asking. I just, that. I just read it this afternoon. Did you just get it today too? No, I didn't get it today. I think it came in late last week. Okay. Um, I'd like a little prep time on that. Sure. As, as would we all. Any other questions uh, for Mike on, uh, on this invoice? So is the question really, at what point are we paying them? Are we, um, it seems like, you know, we, we've got two invoices here that exceed the amount for year one. Um, is there any reason why we wouldn't just review each one of these invoices and agree to these and be done for this year? And then. No, um, how, how it'll work is uh, I'd like to have us vote uh, to agree to Mike's second proposal that at the end of each year, uh, we will pay that 144000 There was also a discussion of doing it 12000 per month where we would do it monthly, but I think it's simpler to do it at the end of the year with one payment each year to fulfill what we had said um, at a previous meeting of that we're going to divide it up over 10 years uh, at 0% interest. When we approve these invoices, their timeline, I believe, is that they will send us all of these invoices within the next two years. We'll approve them for payment, but we won't pay them you know, when we approve them, if that is clear, uh, we will pay only 144000 at the end of February 2022, and then we'll pay another 144000 in February of 2023. Um, so we will approve, you know, a million four hundred thousand or whatever the number is, a million six uh, before we, you know, even pay 280 is how I'm estimating the timeline. Does that make sense, Aaron? Yeah, yeah. I'm just looking at it and thinking, I, I don't think I had put it in perspective that we were going to ask them to wait a year for their first payment. So by paying at the end of the year versus the beginning or mid or whatever. How's everybody else feel about that? Oh, I think the ILA was clear. We could have had them bond it themselves and we pay it over 10 years. I, I mean, that was part of the ILA that we had up to 10 years to pay that. Oh, pay. no, I, I understand that we have up to 10 years. I'm just asking about the part of each year we're not paying till the end of the year versus. I always took it. It was going to be at the end of the year, but I, you know, I don't know that I focus on it really one way or the other. Yeah. I don't think we were definitive. But... Well, Mike, the, uh, the port has agreed to this uh, payment schedule, right? Correct. Yeah, again, I'm not, I'm fine with the 10 years. We, everybody's agreed to that. I was just looking at the timing. That's why I think Mike brought up two options. One, we pay them on demand. And one, we make, every, at the end of every 12 years, we give them a payment. If that's- well, It was not on demand, but yes, it was pay them up front. So they had a little bit of money to prime the pump or to pay them at the end of the year. Yeah. The recommendation I received was to do it at the end of the year. So that's the way I wrote up my recommendation. And the rationale to go to uh, Port Orchard's uh, presentation to us tonight and asking to have a million sooner yeah. is this is the whole reason we want we wanted to push this these payments out is because this was the fourth project that was down the list and it was an extra request that came this year to pay this project. Um, and so we don't, I, I would still disagree with trying to move money sooner in front of the top three projects. And that was the, uh, a piece of the 10 years of making cash flow work to make sure we could pay those other projects. I guess my question at the moment would be, are we approving when we're gonna pay these 10 payments or are we approving these invoices as they stand? Or are they yes, and, yes and yes. We'll first approve the process of that we'll pay the 144000 at the end of the year. And then we will approve both of these invoices for the work that was done and that they will enter into the queue 
of what will get paid out then over the next 10 years. Is that so clear the to everybody? Is, the result is that both of those uh, invoices will be paid by the port. So the contractor will be paid. We're right. just accumulating right. or repayment. Understood. Okay, so for the first one, can I have a motion to the effect that we'll pay the port at the end of the year, uh, broken down into those 10 payments with 0% interest? And and what, what are we defining as end of year? February. Mike, February. Mike had put up that it started in March of 2021 so that it will be February. paid in February of 2020. 2022. Okay. You got it, Aaron, or you want me to take a stab at it? Uh, uh, yeah, you go ahead and rephrase it. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, enter, well, I don't know, I guess we don't need to enter an agreement, that we restructure the payments uh, for the Port of Bremerton project uh, annually at $144,000 to be paid out at the end of each February for the next 10 consecutive years. I'll second that. Thank you, Pat. Uh, any discussion on this? Is that 144000 even? Is that the correct number? It's just easier to do it that way. The last payment will make any adjustment. Okay. It's, I just, it's actually $1,436,000. Thirty-seven nine or something Got like it. that, but it's That's an odd number. It's close enough to four hundred and forty-four thousand. Okay, I'll second. Uh, I believe we have the second from oh, Pat. Sorry. And so, just any discussion? Any other discussion? No, not with that. Okay, uh, let's vote. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed, say nay. All right. Uh, agreement uh, to pay in that structure. Thank you. Uh, and then the second piece to this is these first two invoices that we uh, have our eyeballs on them, see them, and agree to pay uh, the two invoices that Mike has referenced. Yeah, I am. Um, I still bring up the fact I would I would strongly suggest that we use Barker Creek also as the set of eyes to give us a, a third party approval on these that, and they can go back to the port and verify the work that's that's been accomplished that it's reflected here. I'd like to move to table this to next month. All right. Uh, I, I received that without going uh, any further uh, with it. Um, and I think that's an excellent process, Aaron, to have Barker Creek uh, look at it and to get you involved uh, directly with uh, these discussions. So. Thank you for um, being willing to do that again. Okay, with that, so, uh, uh, do, well, does that mean the port, the port the cannot move, pay Joel move, Cohen until uh, July? The second? That's correct. Uh, it is correct that that's going to happen, but um, we were trying to get them processed uh, today where we would uh, be able to um, vote on those and to agree to them. And it is correct that the port will not pay out to Joel Cohen until uh, we as a board agree to these invoices. Um, so we are delaying them uh, by uh, tabling this to next month. But uh, both Aaron and John bring up uh, good points on that Barker Creek uh, should um, be a part of this. That's why we hired them as our construction consultants and to get Aaron included in on uh, these discussions. So I think there's a motion on the floor that was never seconded or voted on. Did I miss something? No, I, I don't think so. Um, I think we had a motion for the repayment schedule um, for how we were going to do it. But then we began to speak about the two invoices and John did move to table uh, the uh, discussion on paying the two invoices until next month. That was the only motion that was put forward. And so what do we do with that motion then? Uh, I, I said that I received that and that we would move to, that we would move it to next month, that we 
don't need to go through the entire process. If we, okay. we can we can take a vote on that um, and complete that process. So is there a, a second for that for John to John's move to table? Well, I'll second it. Thank you, Aaron. And then any discussion on tabling until next month. Uh, I, I, I'm opposed to penalizing Joel Cohen and getting paid in a timely manner because we in the port perhaps didn't have our act together on the invoice review process. I guess my view is, isn't he only, aren't we only paying it out in, in February anyway? Um, you know, he's going to get paid from port, uh, from port of Bremerton whenever they pay him just, Ports getting reimbursed in February. So well, he's reimbursed? not going to get paid till apparently till we approve these invoices. Yeah, part, part, of, part of the contract that the port has with Joel Cohen is that we have to approve these before they will pay him out. Oh. And so um, while we're not the ones directly paying it, we still are the mechanism. Uh, for him to get paid. And so that's what Walt is referring to. I, I think in, if that's the case going forward, let's use Barker Creek. But I, I think for this one, again, you know, Brian's reviewed it. We've all had a chance to look at it now. I mean, it, it clearly applies to the public facilities stuff that we've already improved. I would say vote on it now one way or the other. And there was a description of services provided. Uh, right. I had a chance to read it. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't read it. Being the guy who has a full time job, uh, two hours before our meeting, that's not going to work for me. So um, that, that's why I'd like to kick the can just to be able to read. When did we actually receive this? Three nineteen p.m. No, I mean not the board, but the PFD. Um, I received the first invoice. Um, Right after 520, the second, in, uh, I mean, the first, uh, after about the end of April, the, the second invoice, I got, what, four days, five days before the meeting. I included in the package because all we were going to do was to approve them, uh, this documentation and the explanation of the progress report I received. Thursday or Friday of last week. I, so I, I, included in the in the package, but not well. Go ahead, Pat. Tuesday. Yeah, I have a hard time penalizing them when they sent it promptly for them. How, how about a compromise of uh, since we received the second invoice on five twenty uh, that we would pay the one that we received in April. Uh, as, a, as a gesture of goodwill and that this is a partnership that we're going to do and that way they can pay him and continue moving forward. And then we will get um, cons our construction consultant involved in the process as well as Aaron for future invoices, including the second one. Uh, would that uh, be a good middle ground for tonight? I, I think that's penalizing them for uh, something that we maybe should have taken care of ourselves. Let, this is Brian. Let me jump in here because um, there's, there's a missing piece. They may have sent invoices, but but Mike and I have been asking the port for over 30 days to to explain their relationship with Joel Cohn, show us the contract that says we have to be involved and and in the review process and approval process. Uh, the port did not give us that agreement until 2.40 p.m. today. So, so this really is less on the PFD than it is on, on the port foot dragging on a very simple request to you know, get, give us your contract. Let us see how, how your process works so we can figure out how to make our process you know, dovetail with that. Brent, are there any similar issues with the other one, or can we vote? Not, I, and I don't even view it as a compromise. I mean, if that's the case, then table Joel Cohen till next month when we have a chance to review it. But the other one stated April 20th, even though we're getting it today, we've had it for a month. I, I, I don't know that I see an issue with it.
You want you want a motion, Darren? Well, I think no. We we have a motion on the table to table, um, and we're having discussion on that. Uh, motion to table. So we have a, a first and a second. We can call for a vote, but or uh, John, let's go ahead, Tom. What did you I say? Rescind his motion. If so desired. But I, yeah. I think I think you're right. I think we should consider the older invoice and, and perhaps not approve the, the newer one. Anybody else want to come in with their opinion so that we can make this efficient for how we do it? Well, I think we need to make it clear to them a certain amount of time we need to have this documentation before the meeting. Yes, I don't know and, if I, agree. and I will jump into the middle of that too directly because that's, that's ridiculous. We all know what timing is. Um, and then if we do this, if we go ahead and, and give approval on the 86,000, I think we need to make sure it's understood that they are to pay it you know, within the 30 days. In other words, it, you know, we don't approve it and then it, it doesn't get paid till July anyway. I mean, we're, we're doing well, this. I think, I think at that point it's the courts to yeah. handle how the court wants care. to. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we have a motion to amend uh, or to uh, the table. Uh, let's take a vote on that uh, by voting I. You would push all of this to next month by voting no. Uh, you would bring up the uh, possibility of uh, paying the first invoice, but not the second invoice. Uh, so uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Change my mind. <laughs> and all those, uh, those opposed say nay. 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 So the nays have it. And so at this point, uh, we're back to uh, two invoices before us, and I will allow the board to put forward the motion that they think is best. I'd like to move to uh, approve the, and I, I can't move the screen, move to table the Joel Cohen one until next meeting and approve the other one. They're both, uh, they're both Joel Cohen. Uh, they're both Joel Cohen. Yeah, it's the, uh, sorry, it's the one that says regional, public regional event center, Design fee, architect, engineering. That's the one. Eighty-six thousand three hundred. Right. And then the other one that says Joel Cohen service contract that's dated May twentieth is the one I would table till next week or next month. All right. Can I have a second? I will second that. Thank you, Tom. Now, any discussion on that motion? So that's actually an interesting point, Phil. You know, I think we were trying to do this to make sure that. Co the Joel Cohen's company managed to stay whole, but actually, is this first draw of eighty six thousand? Does that is that money that is due to Cohen, or is it only the second? Do right, that's why I thought it was different because the one's very clear, Joel Cohen. The second one says something different. If they're both to Joel, that's that's fine. The one stated earlier, but I, I guess. I mean, Mike, you, you, you guys looked at the work that was completed on this first invoice of April. Is that Cohen's design work or what? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I haven't read I, any of the report, which both of these appear to be. If you look down, both those items are right there on that screen. So I won't be voting today. So stay any there. Any discussion? Joe. That now you have me go. I would say, I mean, I, I, I have reviewed this while, you know, we've been doing our meeting. I've got a second screen. I've looked at it. I would say the, the first one of the 86,000, that invoice was dated April 22nd. It's been submitted. I, I, would, I would approve that one. With the notation to the to the port and any other entity that we deal with, them, don't give us something you know two hours before and expect us to vote on it. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor by Phil. Do we have a second? Did we second. do that? I apologize if I got confused there. Yeah, Tom. Second. Do we have a second. Yeah, Tom. Tom second. second. Yes, that's right. We're on discussion. I apologize. Uh, so let's call this to a vote. All those in favor of paying. The 86,000, and let me rephrase that, it is approving the 86,000, 
they will get paid at the 144 at the end of the year. Uh, but approving this invoice, uh, say aye. 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 And any opposed say nay. And any abstentions? All right, the motion passes. And so, uh, Mike, if you would uh, communicate all that has been said to Jim Rothlin and to the Port of Bremerton and make sure that we get Aaron uh, connected to those meetings and discussions as well as Barker Creek. Yes, sir. Mike, you got that? Thank you. I got it. All right. Then item number seven, I will direct each of you to read the reports on your own time and uh, anything else before we adjourn the meeting. All right, then at this point, I'd, I'd like to uh, call the meeting uh, or, or adjourn the meeting and have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thank you all. Bye, Thank all. you. Take care. Right. Bye -bye. Thanks, Dan. Good night. Bye.